I like reading articles from Pocketworthy because um, they're fun to read. They're educational, and they have a little bit of history within them. Uh, and they're entertaining. I, I like them. I want to read this, you all. When California went to war over eggs, do you say, Gina, is that true? Yes, I'm saying it's true. I never heard of it, but okay, we can, we can hear about it. It says, as the gold rush brought more settlers to San Francisco, battles erupted over another substance of a similar hue, the egg yolks of a remote seabird colony. This is really strange, you all, but it's interesting. This is the Smithsonian Magazine. I uh, say, look at that. So here they are. They're climbing on the cliffs. They're gathering the eggs. That's what they're doing. It says it was the aftermath of the California gold rush that instigated the whole hard-boiled affair. <laughs> I like that. The discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill in 1848 triggered one of the largest mass migrations in American history between 1848 and 1855. Some 300,000 fortune hunters flocked to California from all over the world in hopes of finding gold. Ships began pouring into the San Francisco Bay, depositing an endless wave of gold seekers, entrepreneurs, and troublemakers. Well, they had all that back then. Well, we got all that right now. As the gateway to the gold mines, San Francisco became the fastest growing city in the world. Within two years of the 1848 discovery, San Francisco's population mushroomed from around 800 to over 20,000, with hundreds of thousands of miners passing through the city each year on their way to the gold fields. Well, I hope you ain't too long, because I don't want to read it this long. The feverish growth strained the area's modest agricultural industry, and farmers struggled to keep up with the influx of hungry 49ers, and food prices skyrocketed. It was a protein, a hungry town, but there wasn't anything to eat. They didn't have the infrastructure to feed all the hungry male workers. So chicken eggs were particularly scarce, and they cost up to a dollar apiece. Oh my gosh! The equivalent of $30 today. When San Francisco first became a city, its constant cry was for eggs. A journalist recalled in 1881, the situation became so dire that the grocery stores started placing egg-wanted advertisements in newspapers. And in 1857, advertisement in the Sonoma County Journal read, Wanted butter and eggs for which the highest price will be paid. That is that is wild, a dollar a piece back then, and that would be the equivalent of $30. I'm talking about massive inflation. I don't want to pay $30 for one egg. Let's look at this, you all. The scramble for eggs grew entrepreneurs uh, to an unusual source. A 211-acre archipelago, 26 miles west of the Golden Gate Bridge, known as the Farallon Islands, the skeletal string of islets are outcroppings of the, con of the continental shelf made up of ancient weather-worn granite. They are, a vera uh, they are a very dramatic place. They look like a piece of the moon that fell into the sea. Well, that's strange. The islands are inhospitable to humans. Uh, the coast Miwok tribe called them the island of the dead. They have long been a sanctuary for seabirds and marine mammals. I can't overstate the dangers of that place and how hostile it is to human life. The Devil's Teeth, a true story of obsession and survival among America's great white sharks. Wow. It's a place where every animal thrives because it's the wildest of the wild. But it's a tough place for humans. Still... Um, the uh, Farallones had one feature that appealed to the ravenous San Franciscans. They were ravenous. Hmm. They hosted the largest seabird nesting colony in the United States, and each spring hundreds of thousands of birds descended on the forbidding islands, blanketing their jagged cliffs with eggs of all colors and sizes. Oh, wow, that would have been a sight to see. It is a really different place during the egg season, it's cataphonus, cacophonus, I can't say that word. 
there is just this den of birds that goes on for 24 hours a day and the whole island is filled with birds and it looks like it has been frosted with white well I know what that's from (laughs) yes in 1849 or so the story goes an enterprising pharmacist named Doc Robinson hatched a plan for to profit of the egg shortage he and his brother-in-law sailed to the Farallones and raided the nesting grounds despite losing half their haul on the rough route ride back to San Francisco, the pair pocketed $3,000 from the sale of the remaining eggs. After barely surviving the white knuckle trip, the men swore to never return, but the word of their success traveled fast and almost overnight. The islands were crawling with eggers. The task proved far more dangerous than the standard Easter egg hunt. To reach the rookeries, the eggers had to scramble over guano-slicked rocks, scale sheer cliffs, and fend off clouds of rapacious skulls. Even with the help of handmade crampons fashioned from rope and rusted nails, accidents and injuries were common. In 1858, the Daily Alta California reported that an egger missed his hold while robbing the gull's nest over the edge of a precipice and falling was dashed to pieces on the rocks below whoa that's kind of dangerous you all the eggs of the common mirror a sharp billed seabird with black and white coloring were the most desirable they had a thick pear-shaped shell that ranged in color from gray to turquoise with speckled markings as individuals as a fingerprint rumor had it that if an egger spent too much time on the Farallones, he'd start seeing his name spelled out on a splattered shell. Most importantly for the entrepreneurs, mirror eggs were as edible as chicken eggs, but double the size. Still, they weren't a perfect replacement. Fried mirror eggs had a strange and unappealing appearance. I must confess the sight can be scarce can scarcely be called appetizing, wrote one visitor. The whites, though thoroughly fried, they are still transparent, and the yolks are of a fiery orange color, almost red. Even worse, the eggs had a strong, fishy aftertaste. In the words of one commentator, an overripe muir egg is something never to be forgotten. It requires about three months to get to the get the taste out of the mouth. Ooh. As a result, the eggers inaugurated each harvest season by smashing all of the mirror eggs on the islands, thereby ensuring the collection of freshly laid eggs. That's not very nice. This annual sacrifice, notwithstanding approximately 14 million mirror eggs, were sent to San Francisco between 1849 and 1896. The common mirror egg were an important source of protein for the 49ers, and they commanded a high price. Entrepreneurs systematically plundered all of the eggs they could gather because they were very valuable. They were sort of the other gold in the gold rush. With mirror eggs selling for a dollar a dozen, the poaching industry grew too lucrative for friendly competition. Of course, there was an egg war. The prize was too great not to be struggled for. In line with the land-grabbing mentality, of the time, six men sailed to the Farallones in 1851 and declared themselves owners by right of possession. They formed the Pacific Egg Company, which claimed exclusive rights to the nesting grounds. The monopoly was vehemently challenged by the rival eggers, including a group of Italian fishermen who were granted access to the islands by the United States Topographical Engineers. To complicate matters further, in 1859, the federal government appropriated the islands for a lighthouse. All of these conflicting claims festered into a brutal, decade-long power struggle over the fire loans. The egging season became increasingly violent. (laughs) My gosh! In the words of one commentator, the eight weeks before May and July devolved into an annual naval engagement known as the Egg War. Brawls broke out constantly between rival gangs, raging, ranging in brutality from threats and shell-throwing to stabbings and shootouts. 
In 1860, police officers discovered two parties armed to the teeth in possession of different parts of the island and breathing defiance against each other. Oh my gosh, this is wild, you all. The fighting was not confined to the islands. Boats transporting eggs were hijacked regularly. According to the San Francisco Examiner, there were many a bitter and fatal encounter between larger parties of rival claimants. In boats mounting small cannons. Oh my God. Back in San Francisco, the courts were barraged, barraged by a dizzying variety of egg-related cases that included charges of petite larceny, trespassing, property damage, resisting an officer, and manslaughter. Oh my gosh. Over eggs. The endless turmoil threatened lighthouse operations, but the federal government made little effort to evict the eggers or quell the violence. Local authorities pleaded with Washington to intervene, but the distant bureaucrats failed to grasp the severity of the conflict. As a result, the keepers stationed on the Farallones were left caught in the crossfire. In 1859, the Daily Alta California reported the Eggers were breaking up the government roads and threatening the lighthouse keepers with the pain of death. Then, in May of 1860, an armed mob took control of the islands and forced the keepers to leave. By June, the head keeper claimed the egg company and light keepers are at war. Just a few weeks later, an assistant keeper was assaulted. The accumulating tension exploded into a full-blown melee in 1863. The spring, that spring, an army of Italian fishermen under the command of David Batchelder, Belch Elder, made multiple attempts to seize the Farallones. Each time, the United States Revenue Cutter Service, a predecessor to the Coast Guard, arrested the trespassers and confiscated their weapons. But Batch Elder and his men refused to surrender the lucrative nesting grounds without a fight. On the evening of June the 3rd of 1863, the fishermen sailed out to the Farallones once again, where they were met by a group of armed employees of the Pacific Egg Company. Isaac Harrington, the company's foreman, warned the men to land at their peril. In return, Batch Elder shouted that they'd come in spite of hail. The Italians spent the rest of the night drinking on their boats and taunting the men on shore. <laughs> oh, wow, this is so wild. This is one of the wildest stories I've ever read. But it happened. That's what makes it wild. At dawn, the bleary-eyed fleet attempted to land and the employees of the Pacific Egg Company opened fire. For the next 20 minutes, the rocky pleaks reverberated with the thunder of gunshots and cannon blasts. By the time the Italians retreated, one Pacific Egg Company employee was dead and at least five boatmen were wounded, one of whom was shot through the throat, oh no, and died a few days later. The gruesome battle shocked the government into action. Rather than banning the egging altogether, they granted this Pacific Egg Company a monopoly over the trade. Thus, the ravaging of the rookeries continued for decades decimating the once robust, robust seabird colony. Essentially, it was the wildlife that lost the war, says Schramm. The tenacious truce was short-lived. The Pacific Egg Company's defiance of the government authority infuriated the representatives of the 12th Lighthouse District. Tempers flared in 1879 after the company began rendering seals and lions into oil. A gruesome process. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that involved vats of boiling blubber and mountains of flying ridden carcasses. Oh, my gosh. Oh, this unsanctioned action filled the air with the stench of burning flesh and a thick cloud of smog that obscured the lighthouse signal. Oh, my gosh. That's barbaric. Over the next few years, the company became increasingly confrontational. First, they demanded the removal of the foghorn, a necessary safety measure because the sound scared the birds away. 
Soon after the keepers were prohibited from gathering eggs for personal consumption, a long-standing tradition in the critical food stores, the final straw was when an assistant keeper was attacked for collecting eggs. On May the 23rd, 1881, the United States military forcibly evicted the Pacific Egg Company from the islands. Should have done it a long time ago. After 30 bitter years, the egg war was finally over, for the humans at least. The company's downfall opened the trade to lighthouse keepers and independent fishermen who upheld the summer tradition of raiding the roosts. But their victory was short-lived, for the eggers soon faced an even greater adversary, adversary, chicken farmers. In the late 1800s, a poultry industry was established in Petaluma, just 38 miles north of San Francisco, which decreased the demand for the Muir eggs. In response, the price dropped from a dollar a dozen to 30 cents a dozen at the beginning of the season to five cents per dozen toward the close. In addition, Muir eggs were becoming increasingly scarce. After four decades of unregulated plunder, the population on the Farallones dropped from an estimated 400,000 to 60,000. After a while, there was a diminishing return because the Muir population took a big hit. The equation just stopped making sense economically. Indeed, the annual yield from eggs thinned from over 500,000 in 1854 to a mere 91,740 in 1896. It wasn't just worth going out there any longer, says Schramm. The industry shut itself down in that respect out of sheer greed. They were so greedy. Today, the Farallone Islands are a home to a seaboard, seabird sanctuary with a thriving, albeit still recovering, common muir population. Trying to recover a species is a huge and sometimes daunting task, explained Schramm. We are still only at a quarter of the pre-gold rush common muir numbers. The egg war may have faded from public memory, but its legacy continues to shape life on the Farallones more than a century later. How barbaric and greedy. I thought it was funny at first, but it's not too funny at all because you know what? Their greed got the best of them, and then look what they did. They decimated, practically decimated those birds. Oh, my gosh, you all. Thank you so much for listening to this. And you can find this article at Pocketworthy. Uh, Get pocket.com. They got some really good articles. If you like reading stuff like this, I really like how they write their um, their articles. It's really wonderful. Um, so thank you, Jessica Gingrich. This wonderful uh, article that was written. Yeah, look at that. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Please give this video a thumbs up and please hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much.